Hello YouTube, Dave here again. I'd like to welcome you to my review of Storm King's Thunder. This is the latest adventure put out by Wizards of the Coast for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Uh, now this review is going to contain spoilers in it, so if you're a player uh, playing this campaign, uh, please don't watch this. I don't want to spoil anything uh, for you or your group. Uh, if you're a DM looking to pick this up, then hopefully this video will be helpful. Uh, this, this adventure did come out a little while ago. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to pick it up when it was first released. Uh, I have uh, gotten it within the last few weeks, so I've had enough time to kind of read through it and formulate what I consider to be my, my view and opinion of the adventure itself. Uh, so I'll do the full, full review here, and uh, you know, like I said, hopefully it'll be helpful. Uh, before we do that, though, we'll just go through sort of the, uh, the basic setup and synopsis uh, before we get into uh, the, the full story of what happens in the campaign and my final thoughts on it. All right, Storm King's Thunder is a D&D adventure designed for player characters of levels uh, 1 through 10. Uh, the lead designer on this was Christopher Perkins, who is one of my uh, favorite D&D related people of all time. Uh, you may know him if you've ever watched the Acquisitions Incorporated uh, live games from uh, Pen Arcade Expos, uh, as well as he's the DM on uh, Dice Camera Action, I think it's called. Uh, which has a few uh, internet celebrities on it. I'm uh, not as big a fan of that one, but that may be a video for a different time. Um, one of the things that I like about this campaign is that even though it's for levels 1 through 10, uh, you don't necessarily have to start this campaign at first level. Uh, the main story itself actually takes place between levels 5 through 10. Uh, so the opening introductory uh, chapter in this uh, book, you don't necessarily actually have to play through if you wanted to do something else. Uh, if you had other adventures that you wanted to run, uh, for example, if you wanted to run the Lost Mines of Fandelver from the Strider set, you could go through that entire adventure and then pick up where the adventure really begins uh, in Chapter 2. Uh, so we're just going to kind of go through, and we're going to touch very briefly on each of the chapters. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, uh, but there is going to be a little bit of spoilers. Uh, before we begin, uh, we're going to start with the background and what's kind of led up to where the campaign begins and the, the major driving story behind it. Uh, so the campaign actually takes place after the events of the Tyranny of Dragons campaign. So it's actually basically assumed that the Cult of the Dragon had attempted to bring Tiamat into the Primaterial world and failed in their attempt to do so. Uh, observing this as it occurred was uh, the deities of the giants. In particular, uh, the major uh, god, uh, I think it's Anum the Allfather. Uh, being the main uh, god of the giants. Uh, he became absolutely uh, incensed with the fact that while the dragons, who were the ancestral enemies of the giants, were wreaking havoc on Faerun, uh, the ones to ultimately defeat them were not giants, but humanoids, the, the smaller races. You know, humans, elves, dwarves, uh, half-orcs, gnomes, you know, things of that nature. Uh, so... Uh, seeing this, noticing that the giants were very uh, uninvolved or complacent throughout this, uh, they decided to uh, destroy uh, an understanding or a, a law against, well, amongst the giants, which is called the Ordning. Uh, the Ordning is essentially the pecking order, which dictates uh, how uh, giants are uh, to interact with one another. So basically, uh, it starts with storm giants being the ultimate authorities amongst giant kind. Uh, beneath them are the cloud giants, and then you have like the frost giants, uh, fire giants, and stone giants, and then the very bottom of that uh, ordning would be the hill giants. With the ordning shattered, uh, the different giant races are now trying to establish themselves as the top of that pecking order through different means. Uh, all of whom involve uh, disrupting the lives of the smaller races. Uh, another major uh, plot point that runs through the campaign involves the storm giant King Hecaton, uh, his daughters, and his wife. Uh, King Hecaton is basically very indifferent to the smaller races, uh, not a huge fan of them, uh, but doesn't outright despise them. Uh, his wife, Neri, uh, the queen, was always a big supporter of the smaller races and always uh, got along with them really well. Um, one of the major events that sets off the beginning of the campaign is the fact that uh, Neri, uh, Neri, the queen of the storm giants, is actually killed while uh, on a mission to uh, meet with and interact with the smaller races. Uh, when King Hecaton finds out about that, he becomes incensed 
and himself actually in, eventually goes missing. Um, while he's missing, uh, his youngest daughter, uh, Ceresa, is placed in charge. This doesn't sit well with the two older daughters, uh, Miram and Nim, who plot basically to uh, overthrow Ceresa. And while this is all going on, there's just chaos uh, throughout the, the Storm Giant Kingdom, uh, which creates uh, big problems. Um, taking advantage of this, uh, throughout all of this, is the blue dragon, the ancient blue dragon, Imrith. Uh, Imrith has actually orchestrated the death of Neri and the abduction of uh, King Hecaton. Uh, now, uh, Imrith is actually allied with an organization called the Kraken Society. Uh, so they've killed the queen and kidnapped the king. Now, the whole reason that Imrith has done this is that he looks to um, steal an artifact called the uh, Worm Skull Throne, uh, which is the throne in which the, uh, the, the rulers of the Storm Giants sit upon, and ultimately the, uh, the individual in charge of all the giant kind. Uh, so that's something that, that uh, the Blue Dragon Imrith wants to, uh, to add to his collection. Uh, and that's, those are the, the two kind of storylines, is the shattering of the Ordning and the disappearance of the king, who's, you know, through his disappearance, obviously, is causing a lot of chaos. Um, one of the great features of this book, actually, something that I really like, is it's a very open-ended uh, campaign, at least throughout uh, the first uh, fair amount of it. Uh, it includes this flowchart. Uh, the flowchart gives you which chapters to go through, the potential options that you have, and how they interact with the next uh, set of options. So, uh, for example, if you wanted to start with your uh, the first level adventure in this book, The Great Upheaval, you start there, you go to chapter two. Uh, chapter two is where you're at fifth level, and the basic idea is that you are uh, in a location that becomes attacked by a group of giants, and it's your uh, duty to basically help uh, fend off the, the giant attack, defeat them, drive them away. Uh, so the three places that you can possibly do this are, are in Bryn Shander, uh, which is part of uh, Ten Towns in Icewind Dale, uh, Golden Fields, and uh, Trebor. Um, so the DM would choose which of these three locations he actually wants to have the player characters in. Uh, so once that occurs, you know, the attack happens. During this time, the DM actually gives the player characters uh, an NPC, each an NPC that they have to basically protect and uh, try to get them to survive the overall attack. When they do this, uh, the reward for doing this is that each NPC that we see here um, will give them a side quest that they can uh, pursue, which takes them throughout Northern Faerun. And when they complete the quest, they earn either some sort of boon or treasure. Uh, so there's a reason for, for doing it, and each location has, I think, about four or five, uh, at least, NPCs. So if you have a full, full-size party, each player character should have one of these individuals that they uh, get to control. Um, so that's a little bit further on, but if you wanted to start with the beginning chapter, if you wanted to start the player characters uh, in this introductory uh, adventure, then you can certainly do that. Uh, the player characters go to uh, are traveling to a town called Nightstone. Uh, when they arrive there, uh, it turns out it's already been attacked by giants and uh, an item uh, has been taken from the town square, which is the, the Nightstone itself. Uh, the Nightstone isn't actually um, integral to the plot of the campaign, uh, but it just introduces the fact that you know the giants are uh, becoming a lot more aggressive now that the Call to the Dragon has been uh, vanquished. And the overall premise of the, this chapter is the player characters arrive. Uh, they have to uh, defend the town from any further attackers that uh, try to take advantage of the fact that all the villagers, all the townsfolk had fled. Uh, once they do that, uh, they learn that the, player or the villagers, the townsfolk, uh, fled to a series of caves and they haven't returned. Uh, the villagers have actually been captured. Uh, so the player characters have to go and uh, deal with that, um, you know, make sure that they're freed. Uh, they also have to deal with the Zentarum who seek to overtake the town for them for themselves. And they can deal with that either through uh, combat and drive them out, or they could uh, arrive at a solution um, peacefully. <clears throat> One of the things that occurs if you run this chapter is the player characters meet a cloud giant, uh, Zephros who is willing to uh, take the player characters uh, to one of the three locations that are featured in Chapter 2. 
Uh, as this occurs, they are attacked uh, in the skies by a silver dragon and a group of dwarves who have been dispatched from Mithril Hall uh, to try to stop the giants. Uh, that brings us to chapter two, which is again where the campaign really begins. Uh, the player characters choose, or the DM chooses which of the three locations to have the player characters defend. Uh, the giants attack, they go through the sequence of events there. Uh, once they complete that, they get the side quest from any of the NPCs that they're given uh, to control during the attack that manage to survive. And uh, what they do is they go through uh, like so the various locations in the north, uh, which is all what Chapter 3 is about, uh, the Savage Frontier. Uh, so this is more informational. Uh, it's sort of almost a mini campaign setting. It gives you information about some of the, uh, the humanoid tribes that live there, uh, the different uh, classes that you may find um, in that location, and it gives a whole bunch of locations to go through as well as this uh, really nice map, which is one of the bigger maps that's been uh, produced for 5th edition Forgotten Realms so far. Uh, it gives a whole bunch of different locations, uh, some basic information on them, uh, as well as a few of them would have like some suggested encounters if the player characters end up going through there. And some of these locations will be more important later on in the campaign. Uh, as the player characters are sent back here to locate uh, some ancient giant relics uh, to return them in an attempt to restore basically giant history. Um, but it gives a lot of information about different places to, to go through. So, And, and again, uh, a full campaign setting hasn't actually been released yet for Forgotten Realms. So if you're looking to kind of expand on the, 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 the continent of Faerun itself, uh, this gives you at least more information than any previous book has and a lot of different locations that you can kind of uh, build upon, which is really fantastic. Uh, once they kind of complete the side quest and you want to get them back on to uh, the main quest, uh, they should be, I guess, you know, around 7th level once this begins, is uh, they meet a uh, frost giant by the name of Harshnag, who's actually a good aligned frost giant, who's aware of the fact that the Ordning has been shattered, uh, that King Hecaton has been, uh, has, is missing, and is aware that the other giant lords are uh, vying for control. Uh, Hashnag wants to find the king, restore the Ordning, and uh, try to make sure that whatever the other giant races do uh, doesn't impact the lesser races as much as it potentially could. So he's uh, an allied NPC uh, that will accompany the player characters. Um, he, he eventually tries to lead the player characters to a location uh, known as the Eye of the Allfather, which is an underground complex uh, where they can consult with an oracle. Uh, the oracle can provide them with the information that they need uh, to take the next step to finding uh, King ha um, Hashnag, and they're not, uh, sorry, uh, finding the, the missing king um, and uh, trying to bring an end to all the chaos that occurs. Uh, during this time, in order to uh, kind of move things along, the Oracle does demand that the player characters locate an ancient relic of giant kind and bring them back, because uh, the, uh, the Oracle is basically upset with the fact that uh, the giants have let so much of their history uh, go missing and either become something that falls into the hands of you know the, the humanoid races or just gets basically forgotten about and uh, left behind. So he wants the player characters to uh, find one of these artifacts, one of these relics, uh, bring them back, and once that's done, he will give them information that they need to go forward. Um, when they do this, then they bring back uh, the relic, or as they're on their way out to, to find the relic, they encounter um, an unlikely ally in the Cult of the Dragon. Uh, the Cult of the Dragon, obviously the dragons do not want the giants um, becoming more active, uh, so they'll assist the player characters in any way that they can in order to um, make it so that uh, the player characters succeed and that things kind of go back to normal, freeing up the, the dragons to the point where you know they don't have to worry about the, uh, the giants uh, coming after them type of thing. One of the cool things that I like about this uh, potential uh, meetup and the ability to uh, to deal with uh, to, with uh, the call to the dragon is they are piloting an airship which looks exactly like the one in the Acquisitions Incorporated um, uh, videos uh, from uh, from PAX. Uh, it's got the exact same layout, the exact same look, so it's just a really cool nod uh, to that series, which of course is DM'd by Christopher Perkins. 
uh, the player characters will you know go through they find this item uh, this relic they bring it back and the oracle will then give them information that they need about one of the the giant lords uh, which is dictated by uh, which relic that they get. So if they bring back a specific relic, uh, the oracle will then uh, tell them uh, which uh, giant lord they can go after and creates basically a teleportation circle uh, that they can use to actually get to where that uh, giant lord is, confront them. Uh, each of the giant lords or the giant lord that they go after will have an item called the conch of teleportation, uh, which is basically a conch shell uh, that, when used, can teleport the player characters to the Storm Giant Kingdom of Maelstrom, which is where the player characters kind of need to go to find the information that they need uh, to locate the, the missing king. So, as they go through, <coughs> and as they're about to leave and uh, confront the giant lord, Imrith, the ancient blue dragon, actually attacks uh, the Eye of the Allfather. Um, when this occurs, uh, Harshnag actually makes a sacrifice and will do whatever he has to to make, the, make sure that the player characters survive and uh, get to the teleportation circle, uh, essentially giving up his life in the process. Uh, the next several chapters are just about the locations where you can confront one of the giant lords. Um, so I'm not going to go through them specifically, uh, but the next five chapters, that's what they're for. So you don't actually have to go through all of them. Uh, the campaign is intended that you only go through one of them. And once you do that, you confront and defeat the giant lord, uh, either through diplomacy or combat. Uh, you get the conch shell, uh, the conch of teleportation, and then you make your way to uh, Maelstrom, which is part of chapter 10. Once we... Uh, once we get there. Uh, so Maelstrom is underwater and you need the, the conch of teleportation to get there. Uh, once the player characters arrive, um, they obviously notice that uh, there's a lot of things not going well uh, in Maelstrom. Uh, and it gives them the opportunity to confront uh, Miram and Nim, the cloud giant sisters who were working with Imrith uh, in order to create the chaos and upheaval that's occurred in the kingdom to date. Uh, when they do that, uh, they go to the uh, the hall of the Worm Skull Throne, and they actually get to interact with uh, Ceresa, who is the youngest daughter that was put uh, put in charge of uh, the kingdom of the throne, and uh, essentially of, of potentially all giant kind if the ordning is restored. Uh, after the uh, the king went missing. Uh, so once they're here, and once they go through all of that information, they have the ability to determine uh, where Hecaton, uh, the king, is located. Uh, once they do that, uh, you bring you, it brings us to chapter 11, uh, where the player characters uh, embark on the quest to rescue the king, who is being held captive by the Kraken Society on board, the uh, the vessel, uh, what do we have here? Uh, the vessel, the Morkoth, which is uh, actually a really cool looking ship because it's uh, designed to look like a giant squid. And uh, on there, you know, you have uh, King Hecaton. Uh, the the uh, Morkoth itself is captained by an archmage, uh, Tholtz, uh, what's his last name here? Uh, Tholtz Daggerdark. Uh, so he's the captain of the Morkoth and the leader of, or the the face of, I should say, the Kraken Society. Uh, however, uh, he's not the overall leader of the Kraken Society. The overall leader of the Kraken Society is actually a Kraken um, named Slackerthel, which I, again, I probably pronounced wrong. But as the player characters make their attempt uh, to rescue the King Hakaton, uh, the Kraken attacks the uh, the ship and attempt to uh, to sink it. And the player characters uh, have the ability um, to basically they rescue the king. Move on to the final chapter. All that's really left uh, is to uh, confront Imrith and uh, defeat it. So uh, the the last part of the campaign has uh, King Hecaton or another uh, powerful giant accompany the party on the final quest to defeat the Blue Dragon who set this kind of all into, into play from the beginning. 
Uh, and that's basically the brief overview. There's a lot more information to go into, but I just wanted to kind of skim over it and certainly give you the opportunity to read through it uh, and create your own uh, campaign out of that. Um, now, as the way that this is written, I think it's fantastically done. I uh, really like it, and it's a structure that I actually really enjoy and something that I hope that they continue to do. A lot of these pre-written campaigns have a tendency to be uh, way too uh, linear and all-encompassing. Uh, so basically, what, what that normally means is if you look at things like the Tyranny of Dragons uh, or even published adventures from previous editions, the player, everything the player characters do are very strongly tied to the main story, uh, the major events that are occurring, and that's more or less it. Uh, with this campaign, it's still heavily involved. I mean, you're, there's a lot of things that are happening that are driving the plot forward, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity for the player characters to kind of do other stuff. Uh, so like I said, Chapter 3 uh, has them doing the side quests that they gain. Uh, the side quests aren't necessarily uh, have to be crucial uh, to the overall plot. Uh, a lot of them are connected to it, but uh, very loosely so. The player characters have a lot of opportunity to explore and do as they will. And even though the campaign is designed to end with the player characters at 10th level uh, battling Imrith uh, the Blue Dragon, uh, they can certainly uh, continue to adventure if they feel like they want to be a higher level before they take on such a powerful foe. Uh, there's suggestions in the book for what to do, and of course, as the, the DM, you always have the opportunity to uh, play this a lot more loosely and just have you know certain things continuously occur and kind of bring the characters back in. So I, I really enjoy the fact that it's not like levels 1 through 10, and every single uh, little thing is this huge overarching part of uh, the campaign. There's opportunity for the player characters to kind of go off on their own. Uh, there's the opportunity to start the campaign with uh, something completely different if you wanted to. Uh, the fact that levels 1 through 4 don't necessarily need to be played through the, uh, the campaign itself gives you the opportunity to make the player characters' reputations known, and then you can start setting the events of Storm King's Thunder into motion if you want. Uh, I think this is uh, a fantastic way of doing it. It feels more like a campaign arc uh, than necessarily a full-fledged campaign uh, where the main uh, bulk of it really is between levels 5 through 10. So it gives, you know, 15 other potential adventuring levels where the player characters can do something else instead of having their entire adventuring career and destiny be tied to the one story. So I think that that's an absolutely fantastic aspect of it. Uh, it is a well-written campaign. It is something that I would like to run uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and there's a few other things that I just really like about uh, the book itself. Now one thing I'd like to point out here, once I can find it, which I believe is in Chapter 4, for anyone who watches the Acquisitions Incorporated uh, uh, you know, like PAX videos, uh, there's actually a really cool nod to them in this. Uh, it's not necessarily the actual uh, characters or anything, but the uh, Cult of the Dragon has an airship that's exactly uh, like the one that Acquisitions Incorporated has in the uh, the videos. So if you enjoy that, here's a nice little nod, uh, nod to that. Uh, as far as the campaign goes, I like the fact that there is a lot of choice and a lot of uh, open-endedness that uh, allow the player characters to have different experiences in different groups. So it's not everybody having the same same things happen to them. Uh, some groups will play from level one all the way through with the adventures in this book, whereas other characters might do something different and then kind of stumble across it. Uh, you may defend a different town against an attack and then seek a different uh, relic, seek a different uh, giant lord altogether. It's really only the last few chapters um, with the player characters going to Maelstrom, uh, dealing with the, the, the storm giants there, uh, finding the location of uh, of the Kraken Society, where they've got King Hecaton, uh, attempting to rescue him and then facing uh, Imrith. Those are really the only parts of the campaign that are going to be the same for everyone, or, or very similar for everyone, whereas everything else can be quite a bit different for different groups. So there, there's a lot of options uh, with that, and if, as a DM, you have different groups, you can run this same campaign, uh, but have different things occur. Uh, for example, if you have a couple of different groups, you may have one that you've started off um, with a different adventure and then bring them into this, and then you may have one that starts with um, the Great Upheaval and goes all the way through um, where they can face different giants, complete different quests, and they can all do this within the same timeline and the same campaign world. So that when the final uh, showdown occurs with Imrith, 
uh, instead of having to rely on dragon NPCs to accompany the party, uh, you can always have uh, the two groups actually work together to take down this dragon. So there's a lot of really cool uh, options that present itself. Uh, I like the adventure flowchart that I showed earlier. Uh, I like the idea of having NPCs that the player characters are responsible for. Uh, at some point in the campaign, and the fact that uh, there's a reward for them in terms of uh, quests and treasure uh, that they can get for actually keeping the player character alive. Uh, so that's a, that's an aspect of it that I actually really enjoy. I'm hoping that in practice that that doesn't become too much um, uh, to to weigh down the player characters or kind of make the attack almost grind to a halt. Uh, that's the only kind of concern that I have as far as that goes. Uh, but I still think it's a neat idea and it's something that would be interesting to see them kind of expand upon in the future. Um, however, I mean, not everything that I have to say about this book is necessarily positive. Uh, again, one of the things that is unfortunate considering Curse of Strahd actually finally had it is that there are no maps, uh, no fold-out maps for the player characters to have uh, or the DM to have uh, for easier quick reference in this, uh, in this campaign. Uh, so a Terra map booklet, even if it wasn't miniature scaled, uh, to have some sort of map booklet where they can reference stuff easily without having to flip through the pages of the book itself uh, would have been really useful. Uh, unfortunately, that's not something that's in there. Uh, the other slight issue that I have with it is that the actual... Uh, the actual dragons... Uh, not dragons, sorry. The actual giant lords themselves aren't fully statted in the uh, the campaign. Uh, it actually took me a while to find the first one as I was reading through because I was expecting to see their name and kind of a stat block or to have something at the back. But the back of the book doesn't have uh, anything for them at all. Uh, it has basically, you know, the NPCs that you uh, can potentially control. Uh, it has some options for, for the giants and a few unique creatures to this campaign, but there's no appendix with the actual stats uh, for the Giant Lords. They are essentially basically the exact same as other Giants, except for the fact that they have a few differences in them. Um, to the point where it actually doesn't uh, stand out when you come across them. Uh, so for an example, we'll just go back uh, to the one that I know the most which would be the Hill Giants. So here we have uh, the Hill Giant Lord, which, um, you know, it doesn't even necessarily say the Hill Giant's name. It just, you know, like it says Hill Giant up here when talking about the, uh, the Lord, and then it has what sets them apart. Uh, so basically, it's a, she's a Hill Giant uh, with the following changes. So it has 160 hit points, uh, speed of zero, uh, the Hill Giant's uh, basically a massive glutton. Um, Dexterity speaks common giant and goblinoid. Uh, so all the, the giant lords are similar to this. So, you know, their name doesn't show up in bold uh, where you necessarily like it to. Um, in fact, so here's... Oh, so here's the write-up beforehand. So it says the Feasting Hall, but it doesn't actually have the name of the hill giant lord at the beginning so you know that that's where they are and it doesn't really have at least even their name so instead of chief ga being bolded it just says hill giant so it's something that was kind of easy to pass by once you know it you know what to look for but just from an early presentation thing uh, it would have been nice to have had uh, them fully statted especially if they have unique abilities uh, would have been interesting to have you know an appendix with them in there uh, but that's really my only complaints with the campaign like i said i like the structure of it uh, I like the more open-ended uh, aspects of it, uh, especially early on. So I think it's something that is definitely a step in the right direction. And a kind of the model or the template that I hope Wizards of the Coast pursues more as they go forward. Uh, it's nice to have a, a tight, dedicated, full-length campaign come out once in a while. Uh, but we've had three of those put out to date. And 5th edition is only two years old, so chances are that no group has gone through all three of those full campaigns from start to, to end, no, as well as going through something like Curse of Strahd on top of it. So something like this uh, works a lot better in my opinion. I'd like to see maybe the next one be more along these lines where there's some events that you can throw in uh, that you can scatter throughout another campaign. Um, 
but still have like a story arc that you know kind of goes throughout various levels, uh, or just something along those lines. Uh, but this is a really well written campaign, uh, great structure, and again a lot of uh, opportunities for different groups to get together, talk about their experiences, and all have different experiences up until you know the last few closing chapters of the campaign. Um, as far as how it ranks amongst all the other ones that have been released to date, uh, this has you know a lot of potential to become my favorite of the campaigns released so far. Uh, I am in the process of uh, beginning to run a Curse of Strahd campaign, and I've attempted uh, the Tyranny of Dragons before uh, through an online game, which unfortunately fell apart, and uh, a um, Prince of the Apocalypse campaign, which kind of fell through just because I couldn't get uh, players to show up regularly enough due to schedules and stuff like that. Uh, but I think something like this would be a lot easier uh, for an infrequent group to be able to get together for as well. I uh, really enjoy the campaign, really like it, and again I hope that they do this more uh, going forward where it's not all um, you know, the only thing that a player character does throughout their entire career is this one story. Uh, it gives a chance for the heroes to establish themselves beforehand and gives them plenty of room at the end uh, to again do some you know greater uh, and greater things. Um, anyway, I'm going to cut it off there before I get too rambly. I uh, really enjoy this campaign. Um, if you're looking for something to do, uh, looking for uh, a campaign to run, uh, I would probably recommend this over just about any of the other ones that have been put out uh, to date, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, again, I hope you found this video helpful, and I uh, hope you look, uh, join in you know, the next time when another one of these comes out and I do the review for that. Anyway, thank you all very much for your, your views and your support, and we'll see you next time.